Hello, I'm Richard Long, Executive Director of the Learning First Alliance. The Learning First Alliance is a partnership of leading education organizations representing more than 10 million members dedicated to improving student learning in America's public schools. We share examples of success, encourage collaboration, and work towards the continual and long-term improvement of public education based on solid research. Today, as part of our Public Schools Week celebrations, February 21st through 25, 2022, we have as our guest Paul Winger, who is the president of the National Association of Elementary School Principals, and as part of that, currently on leave as principal of the West Des Moines Community Schools. Paul, thank you for being with us today. But my first question is, being a principal is a very tough job. What brought you to being an elementary school principal? Well, education has kind of been the big thing in my family. My mother was a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher of a one-room school. And it was just kind of something that I enjoyed you know, hearing about and wanting to do. So I started my career uh, as a fourth grade teacher. I taught fourth grade for 13 years, along with coaching numerous high school sports. And it seemed like every year I had my evaluation, my principal said, you really organize. I like how well you keep things going, having so many irons in the fire. And he said, have you ever thought about being a principal? And I said, well, no, not really, because I really love what I'm doing right now. And he said, well, I think you might want to consider having it as something that you might want to do down the road. And then uh, a couple of years later, my wife had finished her master's program and they brought a master's program. Iowa State University brought it to our town. And so I thought, well, this is a great opportunity. So I started my program. And before I had even finished my program, I had an opportunity to take an elementary principal's job and that was back in 2000, and I've been a principal for the last 21 years. Wow, that's quite a story. Throughout all of that, what do you find most rewarding? I, I think that the growth that I see with students from when I was a teacher, from day one to the last day, fourth grade, it was a huge maturity year for a lot of those kids. Also, as a principal now, I see that growth, not just in fourth grade, but in every grade. But the other big plus I see is the growth of new and veteran staff. You can model and kind of mold the new staff that you hire, but it's also, it makes you feel really good when you can give veteran staff some ideas and then they take them and run. And then they say, hey, I'm even a better teacher than what I thought I was. So that that's really rewarding. That's exciting to hear because it used to be the principal teacher was who the principal was. And it sounds like you're embodying that as well. The pandemic has changed a whole lot with our students, our communities, and our schools. What do you think we need to do to help schools, to help children succeed? I think the biggest thing that I've noticed since the, the pandemic hit was the emotional needs that our students are needing. We have kids that have not been able to play with their friends during school, if they are in school, if they've been away from school. They don't have that social interaction. So I think that's something that we really need to focus on as we get back. And I think the other thing is early childhood education. We have kids that used to come to school and that have had preschool. So they've learned about sharing some of those basic things. The past couple of years, we've had kids coming into kindergarten programs that have had no preschool, no sharing opportunities. And it's totally different with those lack of those skills that they've had in the past. What does that mean for you as an instructional leader in your building? I think you have to give your teachers support in that it's okay that you're not doing the same things that you were doing maybe two years ago because their kids are coming in with a different skill set. And so you have to be patient. You have to let the teachers know that, hey, it's okay to spend a couple more weeks on learning how to share and, le and learning some of those basic things that they've come in in the past. They'll learn them, but they just hadn't had that opportunity to learn. I hear this in a, a number of my podcasts about how things have changed. And yet how we measure success in schools hasn't changed. How are we going to navigate dichotomy? Well, a lot of people talk about kids not being ready or they're, or they're going to be missing or they have that year of learning loss. I don't look at it as a year of learning loss because in order to lose something, you have to have it. And our kids just haven't had it yet. You know, so I think that's kind of an unfair uh, statement to our teachers and to the educational system. I think if you give the educational system the opportunity to educate all the students I think back to Richard, I know you and I are kind of the same age frame. We learned how to read when we were in first grade. And I think uh, most of our generation turned out okay. Now we're expecting our first graders to know how to read when they walk in that first day. And if they're not, they're behind. And I think that's kind of an unfair picture that sometimes is painted on educators with, like I said, this 
quote unquote learning loss terms is unfair. But I, I think we have to give our students the benefit of the doubt and our teachers the benefit of the doubt that they're going to come around and they're going to be okay. Part of your answer also reflects experience of the past and not also implies using those lessons in the past. How do you help people to overcome the new expectations versus the new realities? Well, I think one of the things is when you're talking with parents, you have to let them know that their child is different than every other child. There are no two kids alike. And so just because maybe they had an older brother or sister that learned how to read when they were in kindergarten or preschool, doesn't mean that the, that their younger brother or sister is going to be, you know, learning at that same time frame. And so I think that they have to realize that and understand that everybody's different. Everybody grows differently. Everyone learns differently. And I think when you have that instilled in your parents, your school community, I think you have that much stronger of a, of a school system. This wasn't one of the questions I, I said I was going to ask, but I'm curious. Name of your school is West Des Moines Community Schools. What does it mean to be a community school? Well, it's like a big family. I mean, my building is roughly 750 to 800 students in my building. Uh, pre-K through sixth grade. I have 24 different languages being spoken in my building. I think that's a pretty big community. But you know what? We all get along. We all learn from each other. There's traditions across the board that some kids would never get to experience if they weren't in an environment like that. And the West Des Moines Community Schools has a love of learning about other people, traditions. And I just think that's what makes the community strong. And, and it sounds like the enthusiasm that you're bringing to this sounds like an essential ingredient. Oh, definitely. You have to love to come to work. I love being a principal. I love coming to work every day. And I've had numerous people come into our, into our building. And I don't say my building, I say our building because it's the teachers, it's the staff, it's the hundred people that are working there day in and day out that make it what it is. And I've had many people come in and say, there's a different feeling when we come into Jordan Creek Elementary. And, and that makes me feel good because that way I know that everyone's given their best effort and everybody wants to come to work. Everybody enjoys coming and being with those students and helping them learn and grow and be better than they were when they walked in that morning. So I think, I think that's important. It sounds extraordinarily positive uh, place that I'd like to work. Uh, are you having trouble recruiting uh, people to come to your district or your building? Not for teachers so much, but it's getting hard to find substitutes and that's across the nation. And I think people say, why is that? I, I, I say, I can tell you why that is. Most of our substitutes are retired teachers. And a lot of our retired teachers did not want to take the chance of coming into an environment where there's a greater chance of getting sick. I mean, we all know that there's a lot of germs in elementary schools. <laughs> right, right. And so that, that's hurt us a little bit. We also have a hard time. Sometimes we have a hard time finding associates to fill some of our special education needs working with that population of students. But all in all, people enjoy coming to work there and it's a positive environment. So that makes it easier to recruit and hire people and to maintain them. Last year, when they, well, two years ago, really, when the pandemic first really hit us hard, I know I was thinking that I would be out of the office for two, maybe three weeks. But as of those first few months rolled out, out it, it seemed like schools were rediscovered as a central parts of uh, communities and economic life. And now it seems like they're political footballs. Uh, how is this ricocheting uh, whiplash affecting schools? You talk about schools being rediscovered as, you know, uh, central to the community. I, I beg to differ a little bit about re being rediscovered. I, I think schools have always been a central part of the community. Schools have changed so much in the last, I want to say 20 years, 30 years. We're serving students breakfast now. We have daycare before school. We have daycare after school for parents. We're, we're sitting home meals on the weekends for students. So I, I think that we are central to the community. We're a huge part of it. And people come to us, you know, with not just academic problems with their students, but sometimes personal problems. They come and they want to knock on your door and, and we're sounding board for them. We're setting years for them to vent sometimes, and that's all it takes. And and they say the principals wear many hats, and that's just another hat that we, we wear along with our teachers. Teachers are doing some of the same things. How, how are people, do you think, across the country or in, in the National Association of Elementary School Principals, how are they finding coping with this expanded role of educators? It's very taxing, very wearing on a lot of the administrators and educators, the teachers. People in education are givers. 
you know, they always want people to be in the best situations possible and they're going to do whatever they can to do it. And I think uh, a lot of people are putting in a lot of extra time, energy to make sure that family, students are getting what they need. And unfortunately, sometimes then that takes away from what the teacher or the administrator needs. Yeah, very much. I mean, at the national level, we're seeing reports and surveys that uh, a high percentage of people who are principals now are, are thinking about leaving. Oh, yeah, that's very true. I, I don't know the percentages. I, I looked at them about six months ago, but it, they're talking about having an administrator shortage, a principal shortage in the next three years, especially principals that are under five years of experience are getting out of it just because it isn't what they thought it was going to be. Uh, I think a lot of the veteran ones have adapted, which I think this is important. They have a good network. I mean, I have a huge network of principals all across the United States that I can call and talk to about about any possible problem that comes up. And I think young administrators just, just starting out in their first, second, third year don't have that network. And I think it's hard. They don't know where to go. And so I think it's sometimes it's easier. It's like, hey, I, I'm getting burnt out because I just don't know what to do. So I think the networking is huge for young administrators. It's huge for you know all administrators, but especially for the young ones, so they have a place to go and, and kind of a sounding board for them. Having a sense of community, and you're not the only one facing this, as well as hearing how other people have adapted. I mean, you don't want to always reinvent the wheel. Well, exactly. And I've traveled around the United States the past six months as the president of NESP, and attended conferences and see a lot of my friends from around the United States. And, and the thing is, everybody's dealing with the same problem. You don't have to feel out of place. For me to call somebody down in Alabama, one of my friends down there and say, hey, this is happening to some of my principal friends. Got any ways to deal with it? Or what have you done? And they're going to know because they've dealt with the same thing. They're not problems that are just in Iowa or just in California, Alabama. They're everywhere. And, and it's nice that you can have that network to get answers. I think you really hit an important point here about it's the new administrators, the ones who are exhausting themselves and can't afford the time in their minds to reach out. Right. And another thing that the young administrators are dealing with also that older and older administrator like myself, they have young kids, they have young families, and that's a huge demand. And you're not going to get that time back from your kids. And it's some of them, I think, are having a hard time finding that balance between home and work. It's not fair to your own children to cheat them and cheat you of some of those great experiences of those music concerts, those athletic events, whatever it happens to be. And like I said, that's why it's so important for them to find a balance and work will be there the next day. Right. You know, right. that activity after school may not be there again. So you can't afford to miss that. In summary, a lot of what you're talking about is also we have to find new ways to balance the responsibilities in schools. And schools have taken on more and wider demands to organize weekend food distribution. That's not a casual event to organize and be aware about the social emotional needs that you opened the show talking about. It's very different from just thinking about your reading and math scores. Oh, well, definitely. Our population in, in a lot of schools, I would say probably the majority of our schools, we're getting children that are coming in that are much more needy than we have in the past. And, and we're identifying more and more. You talked about having those meals made up for the weekend. When you have 15% of your school receiving meals for the weekend because some of those kids don't know where their meals are coming from, those are major needs. And, and that's not just affecting their physical self. It's the emotional part of it, too. When are they going to have it? And I'm sure, you know, kids get hungry. And if they don't know what they're going to have, that's tough on them. If you don't know where your next meal is, it's really tough to worry about finishing your homework. That's exactly right. And, you know, that isn't something that they should be worried about. That's something that we as adults have to, and I'm not saying their parents, just their parents. We as a society have to deal with that. If our kids are coming to school hungry, they're not ready to learn. And, and if they're worried about, like you said, where their next meal is coming from over the weekend, that's not healthy for them either. And so as a society, we have to deal with that. We have to look out for our kids because it's our future. Well, Paul, this has been fascinating because you have defined being a community school in so many rich ways, but you've also laid out an interesting challenge and articulated about how we've increased our demands on our schools without actually providing the principal with the assistant principals 
that we need, the counselors that they need in their buildings, and the other specialists to help these increasingly needy kids. But I also think you've, you've talked in a really interesting way about the need for community among the new principals. That's a challenge, I think, for all of us. Yeah, it, it is. And for all educators out there, I, I really encourage them to find a balance between work and home. And, and I, I stress, you know, creating that group of people that you can go to at any time, take care of yourself. If you're not healthy with a positive mindset, you're not going to be healthy to your school. You have to be have a healthy mindset, be positive, and that's going to be the best thing for your staff and your students day in and day out. The leader creating the ecosystem, which includes himself. That's exactly right. Well, thank you again for your time, your energy, your insights. This has been an excellent contribution to public schools. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Richard. Have a great day.